Hello, everyone. This is Jennifer Shambrum, CMO at UAPI, and welcome to the 2019 Survival Guide webinar hosted by UAPI. Today, our guides are going to cover the market forces that are seeing the change in the market, the data to understand these changes, and how you can respond to Survive 2019. Also, video is a huge driver for 2019, and today we're going to dive deep into the evolving landscape and uh, discuss the, the, the ever-changing market. Um, and here are our guides today. Peggy Salt is Chief Analyst and Content Strategist at Mobile Group. She is the top 30 mobile marketing influencer and nine-time author, and we are extremely lucky to have Peggy participate in our webinar as, uh, as our industry expert. Kim Yahav uh, brings over 15 years of sales experience in the advertising industry to UAPI, where she currently oversees our East Coast region. Prior to joining UAPI, Kim honed her digital expertise spanning across a multitude of products, including social, programmatic, branded content, performance, search, and mobile video from her years at Yahoo and leadership positions at Pandora. We're very lucky to have Kim as part of the UAPI family and joining us here as an expert today to, uh, to guide us through the survival guide. And we're also pleased to have Adam Blacker, who is VP of Mobile Research and Communications at Optopia. Optopia provides insight into the mobile economy, making it easy to identify trends. And we're lucky to have Adam on our panel to offer the actual data that can help guide your decisions in 2019. So welcome our guide. Our agenda today uh, and the key takeaways are focused on, one, how to engage consumers across the entire funnel. We'll cover the, the full funnel and, and all the aspects of the funnel and how to leverage that. We'll also discuss how to leverage video um, across the funnel, and we're going to introduce also the four Cs. There's significant growth in the market, as you all know, and uh, we like to say it's insane growth. And really the purpose of, you know, you all know these numbers, you're living it day to day, and um, really the focus for, for this webinar is how to navigate that growth, um, leverage the full funnel, and, and also how to best incorporate video into your, into your efforts. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Adam to give us some insight into the data he's seeing at Uptopia. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so p part of my job at Uptopia is to uh, kind of have my head in the data all the time. So I pulled out a few things uh, that I think are, are going to be telling signs of kind of what's happening in our industry. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned, you know, there's a lot of growth. Everything is growing, and a lot of that is coming from emerging markets. Um, and it's, so it's not just in these markets, it's not just um, you know, young generation after young generation you know, getting their phones and coming online and creating downloads. In some markets, it's actually several generations at a time coming online because they're getting devices uh, now that the infrastructure for the technology exists and at a low enough cost. So there's massive opportunity here. Uh, we all know games rake in the most cash, but we also wanted to see, you know, where else are users spending their money? Um, and so I'm, I'm looking at these categories on your screen right now. I'm seeing social, lifestyle, entertainment. Uh, so social and entertainment are twice. They're, they're, they're big in both stores. And... A lot of what makes up the revenue for these apps, it's subscription-based uh, in-app purchases, right? They're painless for the consumers. They do it once. You don't have to get them to keep buying something. Um, and they kind of, whether they forget about it or they don't, they're just getting billed every month. It, it, it's painless. It's kind of like taking an Uber. You don't even realize you're paying for it. And it's better for you guys as well. Your revenue split uh, as the publisher developer, it, it's getting cut from 30% to 15% if you can get a yearly subscription from these people. Um, and then you're seeing the lifestyle category. I have a lot of questions on that. A lot of people are like, what does that mean? Uh, and, and a lot of the big money in the lifestyle category actually comes from uh, dating apps. So Tinder, which is another app that has subscription uh, in-app purchases. So moving on. Again, staying outside of games, like where, where are we seeing growth? Um, I, I looked at year-over-year -year growth from the fourth quarter of 2017 to the fourth quarter of 2018. Um, just to see which categories in each store the largest increase in downloads. So on iOS, the App Store, that was shopping. It had an 11% increase. For Google Play, it was the entertainment category with a 35% increase. Um, and a big part of the entertainment sector's or category's growth is coming from India, Southeast Asia. Uh, and again, that, that kind of plays into our theme of emerging markets here, which we'll, we will continue to touch on. 
Uh, and then something I found interesting in the U.S. specifically uh, that's been growing, you know, consistently since 2015 are classroom apps. Apps like that you might have heard of, like Google Classroom, Remind, Class Dojo. They're just generating more and more downloads at the beginning of each school year. And I, every 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 uh, you know September, I see them rising in the app store. And I think it's funny just because when I went to school when I was a kid, uh, you know, teachers always told you you can't have your phones out, put away your phones, they're a distraction. But now, it, you know, it seems as though they're being told take out your phones, there's, there's, uh, we can use them, they're a tool now, right? Okay, so on this slide we're looking at the, the, the top categories for downloads uh, worldwide. Entertainment, we're, we're noticing it makes another appearance. It's a strong category, but definitely not an easy one to break into. A lot of this growth is from streaming services, um, and especially those entering new markets. Photo and video has been a top uh, downloaded category for a few years now, and I think it's more of a reflection of kind of where we are as in a global culture. So a lot of it is, are tools for bigger social apps, so tools for Snapchat or tools for Instagram, um, or they are photo and video editors. And so a lot of the things that uh, make money are fad-based. So it could be, they could be hyper-targeted, like something that makes your photos look retro, another filter that makes them look uh, glitzy. And they, they make money and they make downloads off these apps for maybe uh, you know, a good six months, and then they're on to the next thing. So uh, that's why those always are, uh, you know, fads catch downloads. I remember when fidget spinners were a thing, and they literally made fidget spinner apps that got a ton of downloads. So this is probably uh, my, my favorite thing to work on each year. This is the, the worldwide download leaders. We, we did this for, for 2017 as well. Um, and so two of the um, – the biggest uh, emerging markets are India and Brazil, uh, but they also have their challenges in terms of fragmentation and accepting payments, but still they're some of the most serious growth markets today. So if, if you're um, a publisher and you're not in these markets, like you really need to start doing your research on these yesterday and to see if, uh, you know, what you do best, see if you can take advantage of these markets. Uh, in retrospect, as I just mentioned, I, I probably should have added the 2017 download leaders uh, chart next to this one, and we would have quite literally seen the emergence of India. A lot of these uh, apps that you're looking at right now are from India. So we're looking at like Vigo Video, Airtel TV, Flipkart, Ghana Music. They weren't on the list in 2017, but we're seeing them here. Um, and there's a lot to cover that we could talk about India and Brazil just within this chart, but I want to, uh, I want to move on to games because I said the, the growing divide in games. What I'm talking about is hyper-casual games versus the old guard. So hyper-casual games, um, their goal is to get downloaded a lot, and they make money from advertising, whereas the traditional thing you think of when you think of games making a lot of money are, um, are in-depth games that uh, make their money from in-app purchases. So we're thinking like Candy Crush, um, Clash of Clans. They make boatloads of money through in-app purchases. But publishers like Voodoo, Good Job Games, Lion Studios, and more, they've proven there's another avenue to revenue, and we're seeing a large chunk of publishers start to focus their energy there. Looking at the social category, uh, TikTok, I'm sure you've probably seen it in the news. It could be the first um, social media app to essentially come from the East and be successful in the West. A large part of that was due to an acquisition uh, of Musical.ly, ByteDance bought Musical.ly, and that, uh, so Musical.ly was already popular in the Americas, but still it's, it's pretty impressive to see uh, the growth here in the Americas from TikTok. You'll see, you'll notice Uber Eats is at the top of the food and drink category. Why is that? Especially when they're one of the latest people to the food delivery game. It's because they already had the infrastructure set up, right? They already have the rioters. They already have the drivers in all these markets. And so when they decide to just roll out and deliver food, it's very easy. It's very inexpensive for them to do. They just need to make partnerships with these restaurants who already have partnerships. They're already familiar with the food delivery space. So they get it. They know the Uber name, and it works for them. And that's why they're just absolutely killing it. Um, and then Spotify just is impressive to me. I, we see here it says 206 million downloads in uh, 2018, and it had more than 111 million more downloads than YouTube Music, which is at number two. So just the domination I thought was impressive, and I wanted to call it out. Uh, and then looking at our next slide, this is, this is about total session time and app. This is a, a pretty cool chart as well. So while games, don't, uh, while games make the most money, we don't necessarily spend most of our time there. So the top app below is 22 times more time spent in app than the top game. We spend most of our time in communication and entertainment apps. I mean, just think about your own personal lives. I'm sure this makes sense to you. And Facebook owns four out of the top 10 apps uh, where we spend our most time, which is uh, startling. <laughs> 
And then in terms of games, it's a mix of hardcore and casual games. So average session time is certainly higher in a game like Clash of Clans than is in Helix Jump. But the sheer number of people playing Helix Jump just leads to a high total session time for it. So those are some of the things that, uh, you know, we at Uptopia have seen come to life over the past year. And uh, now I'm going to pass it to Kim to talk a little more strategy. Thanks, Adam. And hi, everyone. So I have to say, I find these charts so interesting because I remember when I worked at Entertainment Weekly back in 2009, and back then, in order to sweeten the deal of a print and digital buy, we would give away these miniature desktop banner ads that was literally your 728 by 90 shrunk down to fit a mobile phone, and then we would high-five each other thinking, this is a really nice free add-on to help sell print pages. So look at how much this world has changed over the last 10 years. We are finally at a time where mobile time spent has overtaken TV and the dollars are following. So if you look here, in 2018, mobile ad spending raked in almost $190 billion with a B. And over the next four years, that is going to nearly double to be over $350 billion in 2022. So the major drivers of this growth I think, are the ease of programmatic spending, but then also the prevalence of mobile video. And that's going to garner a much higher CPM than the other units. And you can really see this growth area every day, like every day in your lives. So I commute to work by bus, and it's shocking to me that I look at everybody on the bus, and everyone has their earbuds in, and they're watching some sort of video content, with the exception of maybe one or two, who perhaps has a book or maybe a laptop. And I guess there's also the exception of me who is creepily looking at everyone else's consumption habits on the bus. But, uh, but mobile video is certainly a place where there's massive growth. And at this point, I would like to do a quick poll and ask the audience, how much of your marketing budget is going towards video? So here's a quick poll. How much of your advertising budget is going towards digital video? Is it less than 20%, between 20 and 40%, 40 and 60, 60 to 80%, and last but not least, all of your, almost all of your budget is going towards digital video. So the responses are coming in. We're seeing 0 to 20% going towards digital video, taking the lead. And so this is very interesting because you also have to ask yourself, as you look at your digital video budget, how much do you think that you are going to spend and allocate towards mobile? So let's take a look at this interesting fact that mobile content consumption is taking place in apps versus mobile web. So people's phones have become much more than a communication device. It's now our personal trainer, or financial advisor, or ticket concierge, or our broker, or personal stylist, or grocery store, or DJ, or encyclopedia, or travel agent. And I can keep going and going and going, as you can see. But I think it's funny to think that 2019 marks the 10th anniversary of Apple's There's an App for That campaign. But I think that that phrase has just never rang more true today, because According to this slide, consumers are spending as high as 94% in app versus mobile web in some countries. And this is according to Comscore. So our phones are now giving us these little escapes as we wait to do anything, as we wait to pay for shoes, as we wait for gas to fill up, as we wait for our coffee, as we wait for our water to boil. And it's as these micro moments are becoming more and more prevalent in our everyday lives across the globe that the question is now becoming, how can we as marketers evolve with these new consumer behaviors and make a meaningful impact with our consumers? So Peggy Salt has been researching this phenomenon and is here to share a few tips. Thank you, Kim. Peggy? And hello. Thank you. And hello, everyone. I just want to um, point out that you know, what we're hearing up to this point is really massively good news. I mean, this is a turning point. This is a tipping point. We have not only more apps. We had more apps before. They're growing every year. But what's really exciting here is we have more app categories. You know, it's more companies that can get in on the action. That's really exciting. 
Another point that's really outstanding here before I get into sort of my human-focused research is um, not only more categories, but more time in app. We're doing more with it, to your point, Kim. You know, we're spending more time in app. Um, there are micro leisure mo moments opening up throughout the day, you know, these moments when we're just snacking and uh, dipping in and out of our apps. And uh, so that's the background. That's where we are right now. That's pretty exciting. <clears throat> but it, we also have some challenges I want to get to. So it requires, so we have like a sort of a good news, bad news thing going on here. We have many, many more opportunities to connect with users. But at the same time, we have to rethink how we're going to do that because app marketing started out as very much performance marketing. And uh, if you look at the focus on installs and other key metrics, that's what defined the early days of performance marketing. Now, don't get me wrong, it's still out there. It still plays a huge role in how we are driving uh, revenues, of course. But our attention is shifting to driving deeper funnel engagement because, of course, we can. Now, this isn't performance marketing per se. This is what I like to call a mashup with uh, the effectiveness of, say, performance marketing with brand marketing, which is all about, well, if you put it this way, let's just say performance marketing is about moving the needle on your app. I'd like to think that brand marketing is about moving our hearts, you know, inspiring us to do something. And uh, put this all together, and we have you know, very much a question of we have to think differently because we are going about achieving different objectives deeper in the funnel in a much different way. You've got users who are coming in and out of their app. You've got app being as personal as it gets. I mean, it's fiercely personal. Just try to take a phone <laughs> away from a person. Uh, or borrow someone's phone. I mean, this is as personal as it gets as a device, right? And the creatives are also that way because the creatives also are increasingly have to fit with the user context, not just the demographics. That's, that's a given. Uh, you know, gender, device, region, translation is table stakes. I'm talking about fitting in with the actual user context at that stage of the funnel, um, perhaps taking into account other data points, to understand, you know, is this adding up to user churn, for example? You know, it's all those data points. And of course, at the end of the day, people want what they want. They always want it just the way they want it. That's never changed. Um, I've called it in what I write their sense of entitlement. So it's not just, you know, I demand personalization or I demand app experiences the way I want them relevant to me, but I'm actually entitled to them that way. So that's the mind shift change. You know, things are different. You have to think differently. Um, not all bad news because the good news is, of course, more touch points, more opportunities to connect with consumers at every, type, at every stage of the funnel, but you have to do it differently. So if people are in charge, and they are, what do you need to be? And we'll get to this later as I spell it out in the four C's, but it's basically saying that you need to be using the data, not just the demographics, but all of the other data you can get. And interestingly enough, Kim, um, you're, you're into some data yourself there, but uh, I was doing some digging around and did an interview a while back with CleverTap, and they revealed to me that they found that 5% of the data that um, marketers can be using, you know, only 5% of the marketers are using the data that they can be using. So we've got a way to go there. Um, so to the point of what you need to be doing, you need to be focusing on what matters. What matters to the user is being consistent across all the channels. Remember, they're not just only seeing you on the smartphone. They're seeing you elsewhere, particularly if you're a brand marketer. And you need to be considerate because it needs to be personal, but it can't be creepy. We all know that one, and we'll get to that one later. Um, so I've got through what you have to do sort of in your mind. Um, there's a tool set challenge as well. Again, always a good news, bad news story. There's always a trade-off. Um, I talked about personalization. Well, you create personalization using data. Thankfully, we have machine learning and AI, but there's still a lot of heavy lifting to be done there. Programmatic, to your point, Kim, again, coming on strong and very effective. However, again, understanding how to do that effectively is the, is the point here. And um, one other thing we're going to see more of in the presentation and what I'm seeing everywhere when I'm talking to app marketers, when I'm doing research out there, is to 
listen to the impact of um, what is engagement marketing or empathy marketing, and guess what? It's a great fit with video. In fact, video, to the point of moving the needle on the app or moving our hearts, it basically hits on both counts because if you think about it, um, it enables awareness, but it also drives engagement. And if it's done really, really well, um, it's also advocacy at the end of the day. And we look at the rise of rewarded video. Um, I don't need to go into that very much. It's, uh, it's happening, um, very effective. One out of ten users, players, um, is, uh, you know, there's a high retention rate is what I want to say for that. And just overall, that adds up to what makes sense is to understand, therefore, there's a mindset challenge, a tool set challenge, but the two are coming together that we have the mindset and we have the tools, just a matter of putting it together to make it work. And with that, I'll give it back over to um, Adam because he's got some great news. I mean, I was going to say, give it back to Adam because uh, <laughs> first, that's, the data, that's the data to prove it. I'm saying it works, but it's another thing to show it works. Adam. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so what we, we, we you guys are looking at right now is, um, so, so on the left, it's, it's a screenshot of uh, top advertisers uh, by impressions. And, and this is just the shopping category. But then on the right side, uh, it's basically the same exact thing except we filter down and we're just looking at the top advertisers on video. And what do you notice? They are, in fact, on Google Play, they're exactly the same. And on iOS, they, I think there's one or two variations, right? So essentially the top advertisers um, are relying on video like to an incredible point. Um, Wish, which you're seeing pop up on all four of these charts, they do almost all of their advertisements on uh, video and their most successful advertisements judging by share of impressions, are through advertisements. Now, uh, kind of throwing it back to that chart that we looked at with the 2018 download leaders, Wish uh, was on top of Amazon, and they had 128% more downloads than Amazon in 2018, which is probably their number one competitor. So I would say uh, that's a job well done. Uh, so, yeah, just, just the, this speaks to the, the importance of video and that the, you know, the big players, they're using it, they're using it effectively. Uh, and now to Kim. Thanks, Adam. So yes, you happy data is also showing these similar trends. The use of mobile video advertising across every single channel has increased significantly over the previous year. And in fact, three in four marketers said video was very or critically important to the customer journey. And I remember reading a fact, it was a, a Wise Alp report, and it said 79% of consumers prefer to watch a video versus read text on a page to learn about a product. So these studies really cement the central position that mobile video is truly an effective marketing strategy. And it's not enough just to plug video into your campaign. I think to really survive and thrive in this highly competitive market, you really need to be selective as to how you're using the medium. So let's take a look at this full funnel. I think effective marketing has traditionally been about growth, right? We're requiring marketers to master the capabilities to move and guide consumers throughout the consumer journey, and we're using marketing insights, targeting messaging, consumer-centric media plans. But the advance of mobile and apps have really redefined these rules. So let's take a look at this traditional funnel. The old funnel assumed there was a beginning and an end, and there was. It was the conversion. But today, we have so much access to data than we ever had before, and therefore we really have to change what a, a purchase funnel can really look like. Peggy, do you agree? Absolutely. This was to my point before, Kim. You know, it's all different. You know, it's, it's, it's very similar but very different. It's like a, uh, one of those multidimensional chess games where, yes, that funnel um, still applies. That's what we based a lot of our metrics on, which is another point in my mindset challenge. Um, we also probably have to rethink some of the metrics and how we measure them because in the old funnel, every step was somehow an end in itself. It was all about conversion. You got a conversion, home free. That's what it's all about for an app marketer uh, to acquire a user, to make money with the app. Turn it around where we are now, and every conversion creates a data point, creates a, a data um, 
I would say, input as it were, to take the user on a different journey. And interestingly enough, on a journey that they're going to be deciding and we sort of have to adapt to that. That's again, this whole idea of driving deep funnel conversions. Well, what is that going to be? You know, there is no such thing as a mass audience. There is no such thing as one-to-one -one marketing. Um, and segmentation is also very different. You know, we talked about demographics, um, you know, gender, uh, location. That's sort of table stakes. We're at a different level now where it's about using immersive intelligence, understanding past behaviors, grasping psychographics. I'm hearing so much now from app marketers in the space who tell me that they're thinking about psychology. They're thinking about demographics. They're thinking about ways to create better advertising experiences. So when you get down to it, there is no funnel, but um, Look at it this way. It's great. We can all experiment. We can all advance um, and try new things because the data, the tools, the AI, machine learning, all of that is there in our sandbox. But at the same time, um, you know, in a sense, we also have to consider that the user is in control. I mentioned that before, you know, sort of like the, the, the slightly um, creepy note of that. But interestingly enough, um, in-app makes you think about this for a moment. You're in-app. They're doing it quite often. And if we go back to Seth Godin, and we consider my favorite uh, takeaway from his work, is uh, you know, frequency builds familiarity. Familiarity builds trust. So the groundwork is there for something to be anything other than creepy. And Peggy, what do you think about how um, privacy concerns are now affecting how we're using data? Well, to your point, I mean, it was interesting. I'm based in Europe, so we all thought GDPR was going to wipe everything out. People talked about, you know, the, the, uh, the database Armageddon or something like that. Interestingly enough, the, the, the figures are showing that that is absolutely not the case. There was a momentary stall. And this is on the part of the brand marketers, right? So that was the idea that um, – there was a stall there, but uh, actually for the users, it's very different. Um, and uh, you, know, you, you read a lot of research, I do as well, but there is a level of if you give me something, if the value exchange is very clear and you're very clear about what you're using the data for and app marketers to their credit are getting very good at understanding how to engage with users and get that compliancy. Um, well, you do it right, and you do it up front, and there really isn't that backlash. I couldn't agree more. So I was just reading this eMarketer report, and uh, they, they basically published this study from Physigy, and it pulled 3,000 Internet users in the UK, US, and Germany and it asks them what is the average amount for which U.S. shoppers would be willing to sell their personal information. So I want to ask the group what you guys think. What do you think is the average amount that U.S. shoppers would be willing to sell their personal information? Is it less than 50 bucks, between 50 and 250, all the way up to $10,000 plus? Is that a million? And then maybe some of you will say, absolutely not, never, not a chance. All right. This is very interesting. It is all across the board, guys. So we are showing um, less than $50 as as majority of folks, but in actuality, that number is $150. So you, $150 is the average amount for which U.S. shoppers would be willing to sell their personal data, according to this study. And another interesting point it made, one-third of U.S. respondents did say they'd be fine with Google monitoring and tracking their digital activity in exchange for $25. So there's a price for everything. <laughs> I mean, for a moment, Kim, yeah, to your point, um, I did some additional research, not just about the price at which we would um, sell, sell data, as you brought out, but uh, just as a thought, and this was a brand new one, is that um, it's also important to have experience over 
um, discount or any other possible perk. So it's just another point that um, we are fine giving up our data if we get something in return, and even more so should that be something experiential, so something really wild, something really cool. And um, a last point I wanted to make to the funnel is, you know, if that's the way that it is, and it is that way that the user is in control, the user is going to sell their data for some amount of money as we just saw there, um, then it's also up to the app marketers to just get very, very creative about how they're asking for that. I mean, um, I've seen apps recently where it just wasn't like, you know, sign up and do X, give us your data, sign up, give us your email. It was like, you know, do you really want to know if your flight is, you know, if you're going to miss your flight? Well, you know, sign up for these notifications and we'll tell you. So it's like, yes, I get it. I get it completely. I'm getting a value exchange and therefore I will enter into this social contract willingly. And that's the point here because what you can get, what, what users volunteer makes, of course, the marketing um, and uh, engagement more effective in the end. Absolutely. So I think, you know, just to summarize, I think this access to data has certainly changed the game. And this is no longer a funnel like we once knew. I think this funnel is now a circle. And what's very interesting in this, I believe, is that video is the thread. So again, let's ask the audience just one more time. So where in the funnel are you focusing your video advertising efforts? Is it in, only in that awareness stage, that acquisition, engagement, or perhaps re-engagement? Where are you focusing those video efforts? All right, and awareness has it for the win. Let's see if we can do that. 55%. So, wow. yes. A big, a big number. Can I say something to that, Tim, that natural. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just, I wanted to, to just stay on that point for a minute. And that's phenomenal if you think about it because we're making um, very clear that you know, there's, there's a funnel, but it, there's, um, it's actually more of a circle. So I wouldn't be so bold as to say money on the table, but it is very effective at other stages as we're seeing, particularly in engagement, talking about moving the needle on your app, but also moving the hearts of your audience. So I, just have to say it's uh, interesting to see it all at the top of the funnel, but uh, maybe that's as marketer awareness progresses as well. I think it's very natural for the for awareness to actually um, have the majority of this. I think you know when you think of video, I think you think of sort of all of the investment that's gone into television and all of that money that is going into producing these TV spots. And but I just think that there is a way to leverage those dollars in a, in a different way. Oh, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. And you're going to tell us that. So I think, like, as we talked about, like, yes, like, there is, there is all this money that's going into um, to digital video, but in much more of this one-stop shop. And consumers no longer want this one-size-fits-all experience. And if we have access to this data, on how to personalize for the user experience, then you're going to have a much higher ROI because that's exactly what these consumers are asking for. So be very clear of what you want the consumer to do when you're talking to them, when you're talking with, to them with video. Are you trying to re-engage them? Then tell them exactly why they should be coming back. Is this perhaps a new customer? Then change up the message depending on the particular interest of the prospect. And remember, when you're investing in mobile video, your consumer will most likely be, video, will be watching this content during a micro moment, and therefore really think about how to get your message across in the shortest amount of time. And I know that was one of the questions from um, one of the participants that I see in the Q&A, but truly it is, it is just the idea of knowing that you're not having a lot of time, and so however time that takes to get that message across clearly, try and to shorten it as much as you can. And remember, as Peggy said, you have this fairly standard tool set, but you really need to adjust your mindset. So today's marketer really must use data to personalize the message depending on the stage of the purchase cycle and who you're speaking to and where you're speaking to them. So 
looking at these two charts, choosing the right pathway to significant revenues really requires this massive shift in mindset. So you really have to look at and pursue your top marketing goals like your installs, your registrations, your conversions, your purchases, and your target audience. And in line, online, single-digit increases in retention investments can mean a double or even a triple-digit increase in profits. So when it comes to marketing and monetizing apps, the advantages of offering the appropriate campaign at the appropriate point in the funnel can be just as massive. So UAPI is having the second annual CMO Mobile Marketing Guide, and it's highlighting opportunities for mobile marketers over the next 12 months. And it reveals the significant increase in the number of marketers that are pursuing this full funnel approach and the importance of leveraging performance campaign data for their branding efforts and vice versa. So while marketers get high marks for going deeper within the funnel, they're challenged with the best way to approach each step given the shrinking attention spans of their customers. And so given these challenges, I want to kick it over to Peggy to close out this webinar with four easy to remember tips to help you survive 2019. Thanks, Kim. And you know, with the backdrop of what we've been talking about, the shift in user behavior, the requirement for a new mindset, the availability of the tools, you know, put it all together and you can use this and should use this to have a comprehensive strategy. I've talked to many app marketers who have you know, an acquisition strategy or a retention strategy. That's very, very important. I'm not saying it's not, but it needs to be comprehensive because you're looking at all the moments your users are in app and all the different stages that they're going through in what isn't a funnel anymore to begin with. So you want to be constant in you know, how you're communicating your offer, but it also needs to adapt to those moments, those micro moments, those moments, those stages. So it's constant, but in addition it's also consistent. You know, these are micro moments. You have to communicate your offer um, early on. Keep on repeating it, but not in a way that it is being you know, repeated. It's not repetition. It's reinforcement. It's nudging if you want to use that term, and also a great book to read about how to trigger, out, how to motivate, how to activate people, how to get users to do things at scale. Um, but of course, it's not just about the triggers, it's about the creative experience. And it's not, um, it's interesting because there is so much research out there that I'm reading and also doing some of my own that shows that you know, people get ad fatigue. They're bored of creatives. There are many reports, um, including one recently from uh, Verve that is about people being bored with ads. You need to keep them fresh, relevant, and again, wonderful. We have mobile video to give it that extra, uh, you know, ignite it with that extra excitement and interest. And um, again, each interaction with these creatives creates a data point that you use to maybe refine your creative on, in the next step. And above all, to the point, even though we're willing to uh, give away our data for money, and some would just do it for convenience, I might add, a lot of them do, I would. Uh, you want to be considerate. You want to have the appropriate moment. I talk about appropriateness. I've written a few books about this and also uh, papers where we talk about being appropriate. That means the right message at the right time, but completely aligned with where your user is. So that's contextually relevant. That's, con that's the considered of the need state. We're starting to talk now about empathy marketing. You know, empathy marketing being um, consumer-centric, using the ability of the mobile channel to deliver personally, contextually relevant content experiences, advertising that move the needle because you can if you follow the four C's. So I will give it back to our host. Excellent. Thank you, Peggy. Also, thank you, Kim and Adam, for joining us today and for the insights that you provided, expertise. You ha um, all have uh, significant experience in space, and, and we really appreciate your insights. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we do, did have a few questions come in, um, so I will ask those few questions. Please send any questions in that you have, that you have for us. Um, Kim, one question came through that I think would be great for you to answer. Um, what is the best duration for, um, for video? Are you saying? I, 
Yeah, I, I think there's not an easy answer for that. I think that um, shorter is better given these micro moments that you're getting this person. You're not really sure of when they're going to be picking up their phone and they're picking up their phone so many times. So I think that the shortest amount of time that you can clearly get your point across, whether that is 6 seconds or 10 seconds or 15 seconds, um, I think would be um, in your best favor. Perfect. Perfect. And then um, further to that, what, what video ad units are you finding to be the most popular engaging and engaging for brands? Your experience in past lives and experience here at now at UAPI. I'm actually seeing a lot of, for, for brands specifically, rewarded video um, is, is certainly very popular just because you're giving that person um, something, and, I, and Peggy talked about this too, you're giving something in return and in value exchange for their time spent with your brand. So um, we're showing that there is a higher brand affinity for those that are rewarding that consumer um, with, with something in return for watching the brand. And then also from an advertising perspective, you typically see high completion rates. So it's, it's really great for, for a brand awareness campaign, um, playable ads, interactive ads, um, I've seen um, are getting high scores from a mobile uh, ad unit experience and really starting to see higher engagement rates with that consumer. Excellent. Um, one other question that came through Peggy. Um, so during the loyalty and advocacy phase of the funnel, what, what would you recommend are the best ways to market? Give some ideas so to around drive that. So to drive loyalty and advocacy. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that it's showing that you um, understand. Again, it's bringing that empathy in. I've seen a lot of uh, studies that uh, you know, people view brands in a positive way if they have a feel that the, that the brand is listening, that the marketers are listening. You know, they know that we have all of their data, and they want, to, they want us to use it in a way that's constructive but also as, assistive in a way. So be an assistant, offer advice. What I would do is to show that I'm listening, and I do have that through my data and my, my context and other data points allow me to weave together campaigns that um, inspire loyalty because I'm delivering value at a specific point or because I'm showing through my actions that I, that I care or understand or respond. Um, so that's what I would say works there because, again, it builds trust. Trust builds loyalty. Loyalty builds, builds advocacy. What will build trust with my audience is the question, and that will be different depending on the app category. But I think it is using the tools and data points at our disposal to show that we are listening. Excellent, excellent. Thanks, Peggy. Great insight. Um, one additional question that came in, um, Kim, what, what kind of data can, um, can marketers use to personalize their campaigns? What, what, do, what works? I think um, there could be a couple of, of things that you could do here. I think that even just doing some A-B tests, of like maybe if you know that you're talking to a male versus female at the very basic level, um, are you being able to understand their interests? At, I know at UAPI we're able to understand um, apps on a, someone's phone, and so therefore we're able to extrapolate whether someone's a beauty enthusiast or um, just moved into a new home or maybe it's a new mom. So being able to understand exactly who that person is and tailor that message a little bit differently depending on exactly what that interest is, or even, again, as simple as male-female uh, splits, we're able to see lifts and performance in that. Great, great, right. I think that the, the data is key, the personalization is key, um, and then really exploring, exploring video, video across the funnel. Um, okay, great. Well, that was all, all of our questions that came in. Um, I hope everyone that these insights that, that uh, were helpful um, and will help you crush 2019. We will have this, uh, this webinar available for recording, and um, we also have a very interesting survey. We are 
conducting to brand marketers and performance marketers and how those two areas are merging and, and evolving. And so we will have that available in the next few weeks. So keep your eye out um, for additional content, uh, content from you, Appy. And we really appreciate your time today. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Please stand by.